but if the thing doesn't work often enough, eventually we'll give it up. Any questions? Okay, so what I would like to talk about today, um, last class, we, oh, of course, we start off always with every class, we started off with the problem of the day. And so let's go through the problem of the day. Um, the problem of the day, and when you turn in your problem of the day, it's important to me that you think about the problem beforehand. It's important to me you write something down. It is not important to me what you write down, okay? And if you don't understand the problem of the day, do the best you can and just turn it in. We'll discuss it here. Here's where we discuss it. I don't want to work out detailed solutions with people offline. Uh, we're going to do it here. Um, so the problem says it has to do with something called the knapsack problem. The knapsack problem um, asks that we are given as input a collection of integers and a target integer, okay? And our goal is to find, is there a subset of those numbers which adds up just to this target? Where does this problem come from? Suppose you are um, working as a thief, okay? And you go and you break into somebody's house, okay? And you know, you wanna steal things and come out, okay? You walked into the house carrying a certain amount of, you know, a backpack. The backpack has room for 100 pounds of things. You want to walk out of the house stealing as much stuff as possible. That means you want to find a way to put as many things into the house, as into the knapsack as possible. Now, it's, you can always come up with 100 pounds of things if you're willing to break them. Does everybody agree with that? That if I can break things into pieces or grind them up in a blender, it's easy for me to come out with 100 pounds of stuff. But what if, on the other hand, in my house, there was objects of size 25, 50, and 30, okay? Is there any way that I can come out with 100 pounds of stuff from that? Okay, not w without breaking the thing into pieces, right? So the knapsack problem asks, given a target, okay, and a set of integers corresponding to the weights of things, is there a subset of the things that adds up to the target? Okay. So supposedly of these numbers, there is a subset that adds up to 22. Which one is it? Can you look at those numbers? 1, 2, 5, 9, and 10. 1, 2, 9, and 10. That's 19, 20, 22, right? But there's no way to make 23. Does everybody understand this problem? This is a useful problem. You not sound like it from the burglar motivation, but this is a fundamental problem that arises in um, certain contexts. In one of the war stories in the book, back in sim simulated annealing section, I will describe how I had to actually solve a problem like this in practice. So yeah, I'll show you it's a real problem. And the question goes, try to find a counterexample to the following algorithm, okay? Try to give me a set of examples and a target such that the algorithm doesn't guarantee me the right solution. Let me see if I can do this now. Okay, bunk. 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 Okay. So, suppose, let's say, I'm going to fill my knapsack. The objects are ordered in some order. Okay, and I just fill them in from left to right. Okay. If the object fits in the knapsack, I will stick it in the knapsack. If it doesn't fit in the room that's left in the knapsack, I won't put it in and I'll move on to the next object. Will that always give me the right solution? No, what would be an example where you can't? Okay, question, yes. So you're saying what if the target size was, if it was one, two, and three? And t was equal to four. Does everybody see that I can, you know, by picking one and four, three, I can in fact fill my knapsack. But if I stuff it in a left to right order, I'll take one, I'll take two, no room for three, right? Does everybody see that? Okay. And the nice thing is with that kind of a construction, I in fact kill the second heuristic also because these elements happen to have been ordered from smallest to largest. Does everybody see that? So that can't be a correct algorithm, okay? 
What about um, the final one, ordering the elements from largest to smallest? Is there an example that we can use to break that heuristic? Okay, we're putting filling it in from largest to smallest doesn't work. Okay, well, yes. Five, four, three, two. And what's my target? T equals 10. These are now in decreasing order. Can I, in fact, fill my knapsack if I know what I'm doing? Yes, these will fill it. But what's going to happen? I go wrong when I load in number four, right? Now I've got nine. I'm really happy. I'm only one way from filling it, but I can't do it. Does everybody see that? Now, what would have happened if I just reversed the bad example for, the, for lowest to largest? That might have been another idea, right? Three, two, one, and a knapsack of four. Would that work? Would that be a counterexample? The answer is no, because I would take the three. Two doesn't fit in there, right? So I discard it. Then I could pick up the one, right? How do you see that? So all three of these algorithms are wrong. And the way that they're wrong is you found a counterexample to them. And once you start thinking about it, these counterexamples are not necessarily so hard to find, right? You should be brave enough to look for them when you propose an algorithm for this. Any questions about NAPSAC and why these are counterexamples or how you might find counterexamples? Okay. The other dirty fact is that this particular problem is another one of these problems where there is no algorithm known for. Okay. And depending on, you know, under a certain certain set of assumptions, we'll talk a little bit more about that later in the course. Okay, so the fact that these didn't work is not as surprising. But what's important is to see that, uh, you know, how you would tell that they don't work and start to reason about it. Any questions? Okay, let's see if we can do this. Good. Okay, so let's now, now we've talked a little bit about algorithms and correctness. What I'd like to talk about today is. Uh, how we start to analyze the efficiency of algorithms, okay? And um, algorithm efficiency is a, what, what makes it possible for us to analyze algorithm and efficiency in a way that it survives changes in machines and programming languages and a lot of other things is that we think about algorithms in a, what we would call an abstract model of computation, okay? Um, and this is a computation model we call the RAM model. Okay, RAM stands for Random Access Machine. That much you guys probably know from you know, RAM memory and stuff like that. And um, in the RAM model of computation, um, we count the cost of steps okay, with the following cost. Any operation that you do, a plus, a minus, an equal sign, an if, a subroutine call, any basic elementary step in the program, counts one. It costs you one computron to do it. What is a computron? It's a unit of computation. Okay? That's the main word I make up. You don't have to know about computrons. But it's, it's one step. Okay? Now, what is not one step are things that are loops or calls of subroutine. Okay? What do I mean? If I have a loop that says 4i goes from 1 to 100, print out i. How many steps does that take? Printing out i takes one step, but the loop went around 100 times, right? It's not fair to charge one computron for a loop, right? You have to pay 100 computrons if it goes around that way. Does that make sense? OK. So we count the number of steps it would take if you were executing your program one step at a time. And a loop depends upon how many times it uh, goes around, that's how many steps it takes. And in a subroutine call, it takes how much, the actual calling of the subroutine just takes one step. But if a subroutine set has with buried within it a loop that goes from one to 100, that subroutine has to, call, you have to pay the price of 100, right? It doesn't take less time for your program to execute. If you break it, take part of it, put it in a subroutine. Okay, does that make sense to you? If we have a program of the form, you know, here's our program, okay? You know, and here's a loop, and here's a subroutine call to, um, 
a subroutine, and in that subroutine we have a loop. We don't pay a cost of one for this. What we really do when we subroutine is jump to this place and then execute this code, right? So we've got to count all the steps that get executed in there. Does that make sense? Does that sound fair? Okay. Any questions? Okay. The other thing about RAM computation model is that every memory access is going to count for exactly one step. Okay. So if you read a location in memory, it counts as one step operation. Okay. So the variable, you know, say, say y equals x, well, accessing that memory y, x to copy it out, that costs us one step. Any questions? Okay. And the total amount of time that we use in the algorithm is equal to basically the total number of steps, total number of computrons we spend. Any questions about it? So this is what we call the RAM model of computation. And in many ways, these assumptions are not completely right. Okay? Is it true that in a modern computer, every memory access takes one step? Who here says no? Why doesn't it take one step? Right, if your data happens to be sitting on a hard disk, how much time does it take? Time for the disk to spin around and grind, right? And what if you have cache memory? You guys have bad, fancy computers these days. They have caches and things like that. And depending upon whether the data is sitting in cache or in memory, it's not quite one step, okay? So that's not completely true. Is it completely true that every operation on a computer takes the same amount of time? Does it take as much time to multiply two numbers as to add them? Okay, on many computer architectures, the answer is no. Okay, so that's not true. Okay, and um, again, you know, the um, I think the statement I'm making here about loops and subroutine calls not being simple are prob basically right. Although on some compilers, you can even unroll loops and funny things can happen. Okay. So in a strict sense, none of these things are right, okay? But it doesn't matter, okay? Because this is a, a, a pretty accurate model of how a computer works, okay? It's accurate enough that it gives us something to reason about without worrying about the details of, you know, modern computers. Like, I'm an old man. I started analyzing algorithms before there was cache memory. Does it mean that what I know now isn't, you know, does that change the world? The answer is not really for an algorithm designer, okay? Because this basic model is a good enough model of how computers work to capture the essence of, of what algorithms should be looked like. Any questions? The one point I'd like to make is that this is a model is useful and incorrect in the same way that the Earth is flat model is useful but incorrect. How many people here think the Earth is flat? One, okay, two, okay? Most people, some people don't, okay? Maybe no one, okay? So it looks like we have a bunch of flat earthers here. Okay, actually we know that the earth is round. On the other hand, for a lot of things that you think about in the course of a day, or on the scale that you're working at, the fact that the earth is round doesn't matter, okay? If you're buying a piece of furniture, you buy a table, you don't look at the bottom of the legs to see if they, they're, 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 the, 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 the landing point for the legs is rounded so that when you put it on the round earth, okay, it, it's gonna fit net comfortably against the floor. That level of detail is irrelevant to you on that scale. And likewise, the RAM model captures all that is interesting, okay, about algorithms to the point where you can reason about them. Any questions about that? Okay, so from, a, it, from this point on, we now believe in the RAM model, okay? Any questions? Okay. So what we're going to be talking about, when we talk about how much time an algorithm takes, we're going to worry about what we call the worst case complexity. And what that's going to be our primary thing we're going to be thinking about. And the way to think about the worst case time, the time complexity of an algorithm, is to realize that um, 
different algorithms take different amounts of time, depending upon on, on different input inputs. Let's say you were trying to do an algorithm to sort a bunch of a bunch of items. It is quite possible that your algorithm will take more time if the items were in reverse order than if they were totally sorted. Does everybody believe that? That on different inputs, the algorithm will take different amount of time. You have a bunch of steps here. It's ifs, depending upon how the thing goes through. Any well-defined algorithm on any well-defined instance is going to take a certain number of steps to complete. So let's think of the world as being a graph, where on this axis, we have the size of the problem, how many elements there are to sort. One problem, item, two items, three items, four items, dot, dot, dot. Here we have the number of steps it takes. And each dot here represents one input instance, OK? This represents a particular set of items to be sorted. It was a set of four items to be sorted. And it took this many steps. Does everybody see what this graph means? Any questions about what the graph means? Each dot represents on one of the possible inputs, OK, how many steps it took, OK, where the x value was how many items were in the input example, right? Any questions? We would expect. As the problems get larger, the algorithm is going to take more time. That certainly makes sense, right? And we also expect that um, within a, the spectrum of elements for a particular size, there's going to be a range of running times, right? That's why there's a lot of dots in a column. Why are the points arranged in columns? To make sure you're thinking about that. Why aren't these points scattered around the plane? Okay, why are they arranged? Yes. Exactly right. Because the size of our problem, we can't have three and a half elements to sort, can we? OK. So we get a function like this. Does everybody agree we get those dots? We define the worst case time complexity as being the number of steps taken by the most expensive example of each size. Okay. And that sort of upper curve, the curve that passes through the worst example on each one of them, is going to be what we mean by the worst case time. OK? Any questions about that? We could also talk about other things. OK? We could be taking a look at the best case time. OK? The best case time would be the curve that goes through the, the example on which it is fastest on. Why might we be interested in an algorithm that is good, has good best case time? Can you think of a reason? Maybe if you give a lot of demos, right? You want to show somebody how fast your program is. The best case is fast, that's what you show it on, right? OK, so that's not a good thing to think about. Perhaps in practice, you might think, a better thing to think about is the average case time. How much time does the algorithm usually take? OK? And if you think about it, if you have the time that it takes on all examples of a particular size, the average of those times is going to be a point here. There is a curve that can go through the average case time. Does everybody believe that? So in principle, we think about the speed of an algorithm. There are three ways we can think about it. Worst case time, best case time, and average case time. Okay. Any questions? Now, one of these turns out to be the most useful. Okay, And the most useful one, somewhat counterintuitively, is thinking about the worst case time. Okay, And the re you might think that the average case time is most interesting. I run my algorithm on an example. I want to know how much time does it usually take. If there was some weird example that took a lot of time, Maybe I wouldn't fall on it, OK? But usually, we're going to talk about the worst case time in here, because it's a lot easier than thinking about the average case time, and usually gives us the right answer, OK? Any questions about that? OK? 
from, we're going to be dealing with the worst case time because that is the easiest thing to compute about an algorithm that and and in general i find really captures what is useful okay almost ex always about the speed of an algorithm any questions okay Okay, so the important thing about best, worst, and average case is, and this is sort of a critical thing that's going to connect to everything, is that whether we are talking about best case or worst case or average case, we are talking about a function that defines, that is a function of time, where y is time and x is size. It's a mathematical function, okay? where time is a function of the size of the input instance. Okay? Any questions? People get that idea? Okay. I'll try that again. Okay. okay. So we're going to be working in here a lot with this idea of best about, about basically worst case time. And that worst case time we said was a function where it's a function of, of the sizes of input, one, two, three, four, dot, dot, dot. And it's gonna measure how much time it takes in the worst case. What I can tell you in any real program, if we're counting how many steps it takes in the worst case, what you get is a very weird function. This is supposed to show you what the worst case function running time is as a function of n. It is a function that tends to have a lot of wiggles, goes up and down and things like that. Because it depends upon weirdnesses of your exact algorithm. Does that kind of make sense? That somehow algorithms is if statements, how many, you know, we have if statements and depending on what the condition is, if it's a perfect power of two, it might be a little bit different. Okay? If we actually analyzed algorithms, so we thought about counting exactly how many steps the algorithm took in the worst case. Let's say that for a particular version of, of, of insertion source, the running time in the worst case took 173, 6, n squared plus 246, okay, n plus 392, okay? In principle, for any algorithm, there is, when you count the number of steps, an exact function governing how many steps it will take, okay? But it is probably gonna be a messy algorithm, a messy function, and very complicated to work with. So the way that we're gonna avoid talking about individual intricate functions is that we are instead going to talk about upper bounds and lower bounds to function. We're going to try to think about the time, the worst case time an algorithm takes, not by working out exactly how much, many, many steps it takes as a function of n, but by arguing a simple upper bound, okay, on the number of steps it that, I claim, is going to be the level of granularity that we can think about algorithms, okay, that will be useful. Any questions? So we are going to be talking in here about the idea of upper and lower bounds on the running time, okay, expressed using the asymptotic or big O notation. And this is where the big O comes in. Any questions about our research? so far. I recognize some of this may sound simple, okay, and some of this you may have heard before, okay, but I want to make sure we're not missing any steps here, or where the big O comes in, or why the big O is coming in, okay? Any questions? So we work with the big O to keep our life simple, okay, and that's the way we have to think about that. Any questions? Okay. One thing which I'll, I'll mention now is that when we talk about upper and lower bounds, we're interested in the complexity of algorithms as n gets large. 
We are not interested in what happens when n is small. If you look at where I drew my upper and lower bound lines here, there was a place where my upper bound line, where, where, where I exceeded my upper bound line for small values of n. I don't really care about small values of n. If I have a, a sorting algorithm that I want to be fast, if you tell me my algorithm is slow for three examples, for, for sorting th three elements, but fast for sorting large numbers of elements, I don't really care about three elements. Does everybody agree with that? The dumbest possible sort on three elements is going to be fast, right? Because three is a small number. We are going to be interested in proving upper and lower bounds on the speed of our algorithm in a gross sense for large values of n. And that is how we will reason about that. Okay, so what we're going to be talking about in here are upper and lower bounds, okay? And the upper and lower bound functions that we're going to talk about are the big O, the big omega, and the big theta, okay? And let me go through these. We're going to go through these a couple of times to make sure that we say what we're talking about. When we say that a new function g of n is equal to big O of n, what we are talking about is that f of n is an upper bound on g of n, okay? So what does an upper bound mean? An upper bound means that this thing is bigger than that thing, right? That's the idea of an upper bound, okay? And it's going to be an upper bound in the following sense. We're going to say that there is some constant two, four, a hundred, a million, some constant, such that when we multiply it by this number, this thing is bigger than this for large enough n. That's what we mean by an upper bound. Any questions? Yes, good question. Let's say g of n is the running time of Skeena sort. It's a new algorithm, okay? Let's say f of n is n squared. What does that mean in some sense? It means that the worst case running time of Skeena sort is going to always be less than some constant, maybe a million times n squared. That's what it means by an upper bound. Okay? Any questions about that? If we look at a, uh, well, okay, let me go through these again, these one by one, and then we'll look at some pictures here. We might also say that Skeena sort is, the worst case running time of Skeena sort is omega of f of, f of n. What does that mean? The omega means a lower bound. What that means is that the worst case running time of this is bigger than this. Okay? It is at least this big. Right? Let's think about this. Here is the running time of Skeena sort. Okay? A function like this is an upper bound on the running time of Skeena sort. Does everybody agree with that? Skeena sort always takes less than that. And a function down here is a lower bound on Skeena sort. Because so the cost here is always less than the other one. That's what we mean by a lower bound. Okay, any qu questions? So if we said that Skeena sort is omega of n squared, what that would mean is that in the worst case running time of Skeena sort is always at least some constant times n squared. Okay, any questions? The theta function says that if 
g of n is theta of f of n. That means there is some constant times f of n that is an upper bound and some constant of theta uh, of times f of n that is a lower bound, okay? Meaning that the running time of this thing value really is sort of approximated by this description of n squared. It's kind of tightly bounded both up and above by that. That means that this function is a pretty good description of what that really is. Any questions about that? Okay. Any questions? Let's take another look. Funk. Okay, so let's look at these kind of things. When we say that um, f of n, try this thing here, f of n is big O uh, or uh, O of g of n. Okay, I've reversed f and g here, so don't get disturbed. Here I'm saying here is f of n. This thing is growing like that, right? If this is true, if there is some constant c, such that c times g of n is bigger than f of n, once we get far enough about it, we'll say f of n is upper bounded by g of n. Any questions about that? Okay. No, we don't care about what happened at small values. We don't really care about what that constant is. Okay. It just has to be, it has to be big enough to drive C times G of N bigger than F of N, okay? But any one that is big enough will do it, okay? Any questions? A million is a constant, two million is a constant, infinity is not a constant, okay? Any questions? Here, what's our relationship? Here we say that F of N is omega of g of n. Why? Because once we get far enough about, f of n is always bigger than some constant times g of n. Okay? So we see that g of n is serving as a lower bound for f of n. Right? And that's exactly what I'm saying here. Any questions? What would be a constant c that you could multiply any function by to make it a lower bound for something, yeah? Zero, zero would be a dirty trick, right? Zero times any function is gonna be a chunk, right? So we don't let you use zero, okay? But we let you use point zero 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 one, okay? If you can multiply a function times point zero 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 one, and it is always smaller than this, then this relation holds, okay? Any questions about that? Okay, but it has to hold for arbitrarily large n, okay? Any questions? In the final case where we say that f of n, that f sub n is equal to theta of g of n. Here we have a world where there is some constant c1 times g n that is bigger than f of n, and some constant times c2 times g n that is smaller. Which is bigger, the constant c1 or the constant c2? c1 has to be bigger, right? It has to be a big enough number to always drive us above f of n, maybe a million. And c2 has to be a small enough constant that's still bigger than zero that drives us below it, maybe one over a million. That's a good one, okay? Depending upon what these functions are, that may or may not be possible. Any questions? Okay. We'll work out an example in a minute. So, bump. No, okay. Up. 
Okay, so just to define these things one last time, f of n is big O of g of n. If there are positive constants n0 and c, such that for all n greater than n0, okay, the value of f of n is always on or below, meaning less than or equal to, that constant times g of n, upper bound, okay? f of n is omega of g of n. If there is always a positive constant n0, oops, n0 and c, such that for all n greater than n0, the value of f of n is always greater than, greater than or equal to, if you wish, c times gn. That is our idea of a lower bound. And tight bounds say there is some value of n large enough so that um, when you, when you um, and constant C1 and C2, such that F sub n is always bigger than C1, always less than C1 times Gn, and always bigger than C2 Gn. Any questions? Those are the definitions. It is important you memorize these definitions. They're not that hard, okay? But as we will see, the key to working with this is memorizing the definitions. Any questions? So let's look at some examples of what this means. Once you understand the definition, a lot of this becomes easy. And what I will tell you is, if you don't understand, if you don't find it easy, the right thing to do is always to go back to the definition and work it out in painful detail. And then it will become, you can't go wrong if you, if you remember the definition, okay? What does this say? Here it says that, uh, that we have a function. We want to know if 3n squared minus 100n plus 6, is that big O of n squared? Okay. Why, under what condition would it be big O of n squared? What do we need to do in order to prove that this, that this function is big O of this? What do we need? By the definition it said, there had to be some constant, such that c times n squared is bigger than or equal to this thing. Does everybody agree? That's what the definition said. So what is a value of c such that c times n squared is always bigger than 3n squared minus 100n plus 6? What would be a value of c such that that's true? Yes. 3, 100 would be a good value. A million would be a good value. 3 is the lowest possible good value. Why is that? Because 3n squared is the same as 3n, and if we look at this thing, this is sort of a negative number, right? So 3n squared is always going to be bigger than 3n squared minus 100n plus 6, except for what values of n? If n was 0, this is going to be what? 3n minus 6, right? Three, it's a 3n, 3 times 0 plus 6. It's going to be 6, right? And 3n squared is going to be 0, right? But once we get n greater than 1, or greater than a million, I don't care, any constant will do, right? Then, in fact, this is always going to be less than 3n squared. And that is why the big O holds. Okay, any questions about why the big O holds? Yes. I don't know. Zero and one are small potatoes. I don't care about zero and one. I'm interested in asymptotics. What happens in the big term, in the big future? Okay. And so I'm not really going to worry. In fact, one way to think about it is to say these guys don't really matter. Right? Because this is growing. 3n squared is going to be, when n gets bigger, what is going to be bigger, 3n squared or 100n? Once you get big enough, 3n squared is going to be bigger than 100n, right? How big does n have? Give me an n where 3n squared is bigger than 100n. 500, okay? 500 will do it. 100 will do it, right? 
okay? We don't care about small numbers like under 100 or under a million. We only care about big numbers, okay? And at that point, it should be obvious that 3n squared is going to be less than, I might say 4n, 4n squared. Is 3, 3n squared plus this noise is less than 4n squared? Certainly. Okay, you can prove it by subtracting or whatever. Any questions? What about the next function? Is 3n squared minus um, 100n plus 6? Is there some constant c such that's less than or equal to c times n cubed? Is there some value of c where that will be true? You're picking 1. What is a value of n such that n squared, n cubed, is going to be less than or equal to, let's say, 3n squared? What value of uh, what value of n is it such that 3n squared will be less than n cubed? Yeah? By the time you cut it at 3, 3 looks like where there's equality, right? 3 times 3 squ squared is equal to 3 cubed. Does everybody agree with that? So there's a tie at n equals 3. What's going to happen at n equals 4? Who's going to get bigger? 3 times 4 times 4 versus 4 times 4 times 4. Right? So you're falling behind. And as n gets larger, this guy's going to fall further and further behind. Does everybody agree with that? So certainly for the value of, of c equals 1 and n0 equals 3, this will work. Or you could use a constant of 0 0.001 times n cubed. And there will eventually be a value of n such that this is going to be bigger than that, right? Does everybody agree with that? What would be the value of n where 0 0.01 n cubed is going to start to beat 3 n squared? A thousand times that, that's, I guess that's one, that's 1 over 100, right? By the time you get to 1,000, this is going to be 1,000 times um, 10,000, wait, Oh, this is going to be 1,000 times 10,000. Anyway, it should be, I think by the time you get to 1,000, it should be clear that that's there. Any questions about that? Like, one minute. Well, okay, that, that we'll get, we'll deal with later. I, I'm saying it's big O, it's true. The question is, is this true? And the answer is, it is true. Okay, is n cubed an upper bound to this thing? The answer is yes, right? Is n to the fourth an upper bound to this thing? Yes. Is 2 to the n, an even faster growing function, an upper bound to this thing? The answer is going to turn out to be yes, right? What about the other example? 3n squared minus 100 plus 6. Is there some value times n such that 3n squared is always less than a constant times n? Is there any constant big enough such that that's always going to be true? Let's think about it. I say it's a million. A million n is going to do it, right? A million n is always greater than or equal to 3n squared. Can that possibly be true? No, because we can cancel the n's. By the time n gets bigger than a million over 3, that's when equality is, right? And this side is going to keep getting bigger as n gets larger, right? No matter what constant I pick this thing, okay, there is no constant big enough such that c times this is going to be, be bigger than that, right? That's why we say there is not a big O relationship between those. Any questions? How many people see that? Follow the definition and see that. How many people don't see that? question, like, I don't see that as a good question. Any questions? Any questions? So the last part is saying, we want to say that if there is a big O relationship between 3n squared, if big O, 3n squared is big O of n, what does that definition mean? We go through the definition. The definition says this is true if and only if. 
there exists a constant c such a 3n squared is less than or equal to c times n okay or n greater than some n naught right that's what the definition of big o was remember i had that on a previous slide so this statement is going to be true if there exists such a constant and false if there does not exist a constant and the reasoning here is no matter how big i pick c once you pick c i can drive a value of n big enough so that c times n cannot compete with n times let's get rid of this just to make it easier is there a value if n, once you pick c you tell me it's a billion or a google right google's a big number right before it was a search engine it was a very big number okay no matter what that is once you have a n is larger than that constant c times n is going to be smaller than n squared Does everybody agree with that and therefore this cannot be true that is why this expression does not hold okay any questions about that any questions at all Okay. 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 Let's now think about the big omega function. Remember the other one was upper bound. Here we are talking about lower bound. Is 3n squared plus this little the small change is that bigger than a constant times n squared is there if so then what are we saying we're going to say that 3n squared we're asking the question is it true that 3n squared okay is is it less than is it greater than or equal to some constant times n squared okay is there some constant c for which this is going to be true what would be a value of c for which this is true who is a good value what is a good value 2.99999 is a good value Does everybody agree with that so long as c is less than 3 c times n squared is going to be less than or equal to 3n squared right So in fact n squared is a lower bound on this thing. Okay, as n gets larger. Okay? Any questions about that? What about this? Is it possible that there is some constant 3c such as 3n squared is bigger than or equal to c times n cubed? Does there exist any c? such as 3n squared is bigger than n cubed okay if it's going to work we're going to need a small value of c right let's say c was 0.001 okay at what point does an n does 0.001 n cubed start to be bigger than 3n squared What value of n will make this side bigger than that? 3000. You see that? Because now when we get to 3000 there is equality, right? And then when we do 3001, this is going to be 3 times 1001 times 1001 squared. And this is going to be um 1000 1000 times 3001 squared for larger values of n this side is going to start to beat the other side right and that's why this is a not satisfy the omega any questions about that okay what about the last one is there any value of c such that c times n 
is less than or equal to 3n squared. Can anybody come up with a value of c, such that this side's going to be smaller than that? What would be a value of c such that this expression is always true? 1? That seems like a good value. Does everybody agree with that? Is 3n squared bigger than n? Darn right. OK? Any questions about that? Do people see that? I'm not sure if people are staring because they're bored or they're tired. OK, but it should be clear. Yes? OK, so I have been ignoring this minus 100n and 6, OK? That is partially out of experience and partially out of laziness. Let's say I'm not going to ignore it, OK? Let's now be careful here and do this right, OK? 3n squared minus 100n plus 6. Is this always going to be greater than or equal to c times n or n greater than n naught? That's the other part. I don't care about small values of n, right? So for n equals to 1, this 100n minus 100n is a big punishment, right? If we had n equals 1, this is going to be 3. This is going to be minus 100 plus 6. This is negative, right? So for small values, this is not going to be, there's not going to be a c for which that is true, right? But suppose I set c equal to 1. Is there some value of n where, beyond which, this side is always going to be bigger than n? OK? Let's figure out what that is. We can say, well, where are they going to be equal? They will be equal when 3n squared minus 100n plus 6 is equal to n, right? What is the point where that is? If we add 100n to both sides, what do we get? 101n here minus 6. The moment 3n squared is bigger than 101n minus 6, isn't this side going to be bigger than that side? <coughs> See what I'm doing? I'm trying to find the place where they're equal. Let's put it this way. We have um, my daughter, okay, who's now six years old, was born the same day as, you know, an elephant. Okay, elephant babies are to probably are born very small. I know this is really cool with elephants. But let's say elephant babies, when they're born, are a speck of dust. Okay? We know elephants grow fast, right? Because they get very big, right? Eventually, the elephant is going to grow and get taller than my daughter, right? And she's going to stay taller than my daughter because elephants grow faster than people do, right? So if you figure out where they are equal, that is the point by, they're going to sort of be the case where if I start out shorter than you and we're growing but I'm growing slowly and you are growing like gangbusters, there will be a point where we are equal, right? And then if we keep going, I'm going to keep falling smaller and getting falling further and further behind you, right? The place where they are equal is this n naught, okay? And we say that beyond that, I am always losing. That is the kind of reasoning we're doing. Any questions about that? Does that make sense? Any other questions? In fact, it was order of n squared last time we looked at it. Right? If I could succeed in figuring out how to make this square go backwards. Okay, let's see if I'm going to try. The bunk. The bunk. The bunk. Okay. Bingo. Look at that. See? We did that once before, right? The exact same function before we proved it was big O. So it is both big O and big omega, right? What does that mean for us? Okay. In fact, what that means here is that it is big theta. We say that this side over here is big theta of this. If this is both an upper bound and a lower bound, 
right? It says that this growth rate is really the same as the growth rate at this thing. In this case, the growth rate here is bigger than the growth rate of that, right? And in this case here, the growth rate is slower than that. Theta means we've really pinned down the growth rate, okay? Omega means we, uh, a big O means we have an upper bound. Omega means we have a lower bound. Any questions about that? Okay. So the way to think about these on your homework and undoubtedly on the exam, there will end up being a question of the form. Is this function big O of that function? And the way that you do it is you go back to the definitions. The definitions for proving this involve, is there a constant to multiply something by, such that for all n greater than some other constant, the desired direction of bigness holds, okay? If you can prove that, then there is this relation. If there is no such constant, there is not that relation. Any questions? It's that simple. Any questions? Okay, let's do a little bit more working with the big O now that we understand this. Suppose we know that f of n is big O of, G of, of n squared and g of n is big O of n squared. What does that mean we know? f of n is upper bounded by a constant times n squared, right? g of n is upper bounded by a constant times n squared. What do we know about the sum of those two? talk about a function that's, a, uh, that's the sum of f of n plus g of n, right? g prime n is the sum of f of n and g of n. What do we know about how big g, g prime of n can be, the sum of these things? Okay, do we know an upper bound on the value of this? What is an upper bound on the value of that? Yes. Two times the constant. Well, first of all, note that this may is a different function than this one. Maybe there's a different constant associated with it, right? So in proving f of n, there was some constant, right? We knew that f of n had to be less than or equal to c1 times n squared for large enough values of n, right? And we know that um, g of n had to be less than or equal to some constant c2 times n squared, right? What, is there any way we can argue that there is a constant such that f of n plus g of n is less than or equal to some constant c3 times n squared? Can anyone tell me what that constant C3 might be? C1 plus C2. Does everybody agree with that? That is, this has to be smaller than C1n, and this is n squared, this is smaller than C2n squared. Then I claim that this thing is going to be less than or equal to C1 plus C2n squared. Right? Do people see that? Now, what value of n does this have to hold for? Remember, this held for all n greater than some n1, right? And this held for all value of n greater than some n2. For what values of n is the sum of these functions always less than or equal to that? Less than, so, so, so what value of n can we guarantee this relation holds? I claim so long as n is greater than the bigger of the two limits, right? This, only apply, this applied once we got better than n, past n1. This applied once we got past n2. For all n greater than the maximum of n1 and n2, this expression has to hold. People believe that? 
if I get a guarantee that this is going to hold after next week, and this is going to hold after next month, when do I know that both of those things are going to hold true? After next month, right? So, so long as I wait till after that, I know that that will be true, okay? Any questions? So what's interesting is you get a weird kind of math here. n squared plus n squared is equal to n squared, okay? Everybody see that's what we just proved? At least in the big O. Big O of n squared plus big O of n squared is equal to big O of n squared questions? It makes sense once you think of it in this way. Any questions? Okay. Okay. Let's look at some other properties of this big O thing. Suppose I have a function, big O. Right, let's now think about what multiplication and the big O mean. Okay? Suppose I have some function that's a constant times another function. So C is a constant. What do I know about, a, let's say C was 117, and f of n is a function. Do I know that? Big O of 117 times f of n is big O of f of n? Is this, suppose C is a constant. Is it always true that if C times f of n is less than or equal to some big constant times f of n? Can anyone suggest a value of, let's say that this is D. What is the value of D such that this is going to be true? C plus 1. Does everybody agree with that? So multiplying a function by a constant means gives us the same big O as if we ignore the constant. Right? That's why everybody I was dealing with 3n squared, I immediately ignored the 3. 3n squared or a million n squared is the same as n squared to me in a big O sense. Does that make sense? Okay, this is why it's nice and easy for me to work with these functions. You give me some complicated expression, I just slough off all these constants and I get to something nice and simple. If I know that, suppose, is it true that c times f of n here when we talk about the omega, is c times f of n always bigger than or equal to d times f of n? Is there a va constant d such that that's true? What would be a value of d such that that's true? c minus 1, right? So in fact, multiplying it by a constant doesn't affect the, big, the omega either. And it doesn't multiply affect the big theta either. Because if it's true for the big O and the big theta, omega, it's true for the theta. Any questions? So when we work with the big O, we ignore the constants. They just really aren't there. Okay? And it simplifies our view of the world. Any questions? Okay? Any questions at all? But what if instead of that, the bunk? Bunk, the bunk, the bunk. We multiply it by a function. Suppose f of n is a function that grows with n, and g of n is a function that grows of n. If we know that f of n, that, that, that something, a function here is big O of f of n, and we multiply it by a function that is big O of g of n. So we have here some function. Let's call this thing, let's say we knew that uh, this was a function a, and this was a function b. Here's our function a. Here's our function b. OK? We know that a is this function a of n 
is less than or equal to some constant 1 times f of n. We know that b of n is less than or equal to some constant 2 times g of n. What do we know about a of n times b of n? How that grows. My claim is that the product of these functions is going to be equal to big O of f of n times g of n. How would I prove that? How would I prove that the product of these two functions is big O of f of n times g of n? What do I have to do? I have to, that means that if I'm, what I'm saying is I have to show that there is a constant such that this constant times this is going to be bigger than this times this. What would be a constant such that a constant times f of n times g of n is going to be bigger than a of n and b of n? C1 times C2. Does everybody agree with that? If I take this function and this function and multiply this by C1 and C2, this is going to have the product of that. The product of this and this has to be bigger than the product of this by this. Right? And that's how we prove that the product of these two is big O of the product of those things. Any questions? Do you understand this idea of going to the definition and saying, come up with constants for it? The proof of these things are easy, right? Saying that a function is this thing means there have to be constants for it. Saying there are fu this function is big O of that means there have to be constants for it. To prove that this implies this, we need to use those constants to find the other constants constant such that this relationship has to be true. Any questions? It usually follows usually in a straightforward manner. Any questions at all? Okay. Why do we care about the big O? Okay, I have been still giving you an hour. Now we've talked about the mathematics of this big O notation. This is any mathematics or algebra you have to deal with the way you have dealt with everything else in your schooling. But why is it that as an algorithms person, I am going to be content with these relatively crude levels of upper and bound given by, um, what you call it, by, uh, by, by big O functions? The reason is going to be shown by this table. What is this table? This table is a table showing for a bunch of different functions, log n, n, n times log n, log n squared, n uh, 2 to the n, n factorial. These are all functions that grow with n. Does everybody agree? These are values of n that are getting bigger, 10, 20, 30, 50, 100. 1,000, 10,000, and so on. Suppose you have an algorithm that takes one microsecond per, per computron, per step. And your algorithm, in the worst case, is going to take um, n steps. If you know that it takes one microsecond per step, and you know that it's going to be taking n steps. That means it's going to take 10 microseconds, OK, to do an instance of size 10. 20 microseconds to do an instance of size 20. Do people see what I mean? OK, and if it's not clear, I'd like to see a hand, OK? This table is showing us that if you assume a each step on a computer takes a very small amount, one I don't know if I had nanoseconds, or maybe it was nanoseconds, OK? And our algorithm took the worst case time, 
was to solve a process of size n was n nanoseconds. The column here is showing us how many seconds does it take as n gets larger. Do people see what this table is plotting? It should be clear that the, as for all of these functions, as n gets larger, it takes more time, right? The bigger the problem is, the harder it is to solve. The more time it takes. But what's interesting is, if you look at these times, there turns out to be a very a value of n which is pretty sharp between the difference between where your program might want to wait for it and where it wouldn't. Suppose I came up with an algorithm that ran in n factorial time, like our traveling salesman brute force thing we talked about last class, right? If that's true, for solving something of size 10 points, it would take three milliseconds. It's not so bad, right? Three milliseconds is, you know, a, you know, a, a fraction of a second. That's certainly fast enough for anything. But by the time we get up to 20 factorial, kabunk, 77 years, are you going to want to wait 77 years for this algorithm to finish? The answer is no. If you have 10 points, you're happy to use that algorithm. But if it's an n factorial, if, 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 if it's 20 points, okay, it's um, going to take 77 years. Yes. This is on something that will take one, I believe it is, nanosecond per step, which is pretty fast. But the important point is it doesn't matter how fast the machine it is. Suppose I come from the planet Quarex in a different galaxy and give you a machine that's a million times faster. Is that going to change anything? Not really. Instead, it will take for size, if I give you a machine that's a million times faster, for size 20, it will take 77 over a million years. Yes, now you can do 20 points. That's great. But by the time you get to 30, you're now taking 8 times 10 to the 6 years. Okay? Even if it's a million times faster than this, right? You've hit a wall. And that wall is here. Small values of n, beyond which it is hopeless. Okay, any questions? What about if we give an algorithm that runs in 2 to the n time? Of which there are a lot of algorithms that, that run in 2 to the n time. In fact, that grows exponentially with n. And you can get a little bit further before things start to get dicey. Maybe you'll say, oh, yeah, well, for n equals 40, you might have to wait 18 minutes. Maybe you'll wait 18 minutes. But by the time you get to 50, are you willing to wait 13 days for the answer? Maybe. But by the time you get to n equals 100, you're not willing to wait 10 to the 13th year, right? There is a sharp boundary where an algorithm of that complexity can be practical. Does everybody agree with that? If your problem is small, go for it. If not, give up. That's the lesson here, right? That's the lesson of the big O. What about if I have an n squared algorithm? Now, these are what we would call exponential. They grow very, very fast. n squared is a polynomial algorithm. That's not so bad, right? If you look at it, it's practical up to where? Maybe around here. Okay, then it starts taking on the order of minutes. So if I gave you an input of size a million items, maybe you could get away with n squared algorithm, right? But I'll be darned, you're certainly not going to be able to get rid of something much bigger than that, right? Because you start to hit a wall where it's taking days and years fairly quickly, right? If I gave you a linear algorithm, order n, well, even if you took something of size 1 billion, it's still only taking a second, right? What's an example of a linear algorithm? Something that counts. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. If it is counting from 1 to n, okay? That kind of a job, you can count a computer, this computer could count up to a billion in a second. That's faster than I can do it. And it's reasonable, right? Even for functions in between n and n log n, 
n and n squared, something we'll talk about called n log n. You can potentially do it up to problems of size a billion or so. So we're going to be looking for algorithms whose running times are down here, because then you can hope to do it on very, very large instances. And if we can't find one, we're going to look for one that's over here, so you can do it on moderately large instances. And if not, we're going to surrender, knowing that it's going to be exponential on anything, you know, exponential and impossible for anything of any size. Any questions? Any questions of this? So think about it. Do the problem of the day for next class, and I'll see you guys next time. Thank you.